And welcome back to part two of this show we have today with Joseph Farrell called Ancient War in Heaven. And now we're going to the war part <laughs> that many will find very interesting. But first, l let me share an observation. I, I mentioned in part one that we've had Hoagie on. Oh, yes. When I had Hoagland on, damn, I never had so many harsh comments under the video. So... Uh, man, he's controversial. So many trolls and criticisms, and it seems yeah, I bet. many people dislike him for his personality, I think, more than his information, because although he loves to speculate, mm -hmm. he has a lot of good information, and, and he, oh, yes. he's been, you know, first out with many things. But I, I understand Hoagland, because he's... He's so enthusiastic about. It. He's so passionate. Yeah, yeah I know. He gets so he gets so enthusiastic and and carried away. Uh, carried away. Um, but you know, he knows more about all of this stuff than probably anybody alive. Mm. He's probably he's probably forgotten more science than most people have learned. <laughs> so. <laughs> <laughs> That's a great quote. Well, I got that quotation from him, as a matter of fact. <laughs> That's, uh, but I think he deserves a little kudos because people forget his contributions to the field. Oh, he, the personality they, they, is clothing over. You know, he was very early on. You know. Oh, he he yes, his his contribution to this whole field has been immense. Mm. I first listened to Hoagland. Uh, Way back in in the 1980s, when the king of American overnight talk radio was Larry King, right? Many right. people forget he got his start in radio and moved to television. And after King disappeared, it was Art Bell. But the original overnight Art Bell back in the 80s was Larry King. And Hoagland, uh, I first heard Hoagland talking about the first edition of the Monuments of Mars listening to Larry King. Wow. Yeah. So he, and he put together the Mars mission and got Lambert Dolphin and... He was uh, actually one of the people who got the plaque thing. Yes. Yeah. In. He got, the, you know, he got Pozos and Carlotto and all of those people involved with mm. the Sidonia thing. Um, that was Hoagland. And what I don't like in the flaming of Hoagland is that they often turn to... Obviously, ad hominem, but they often lie to take him down. And that I don't... They criticize him for, you know, you can't stand his personality, whatever. Fair, fair enough, that's a subjective evaluation. But when they claim that, oh, no, he had nothing to do with concrete, nothing to do with NASA. No, it's no, all, no, no, no. I, I know no. it's... Uh, we actually, <laughs> in the video, we documented that it's true. We put in documentation in the video just to shut those people up because that's so unfair. It, it is it is completely unfair. The other criticism that people make of him, you know, he did that map of Sidonia with Errol Torin, and yeah. one of the criticisms has been, well, he hasn't gone back and corrected the map with the latest photos and blah, 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 and he should do that. Otherwise, he's just not credible, and mm. I, I know exactly why Hoagland hasn't done that. It's because he's too busy. Right. Uh, he he he's moved on, and he's he's the type of person that's got so much on his plate and wants to do so much that he doesn't have time to go back and correct every little last detail or this mistake or update that. I know exactly what he's doing because I have the same problem. I would love to go mm. back and take all the bugs out of Reich of the Black Sun that got into that because of a computer virus, oh, wow. and yeah. And I would love to do that. I just don't have the time. You know, to go back and revise a book is is almost as much, if not more, work than than yeah. doing the first edition. That's and true. I've got I've got too many other things I need to do, and there's only one of me. You know, I don't have a staff. Really? Because there was this speculation that um, your predecessor in Prophilic what's his name again? Isaac Asimo, that he had uh, lots of children uh, in his basement. Did, uh, you're you're well, well you know you're up for suspicion right <laughs> of, of having a ghost writing team <laughs> like slaves in your basement or something <laughs> yes well i can assure everybody i don't uh, what you see is what you get right. <laughs> i don't have a staff i don't have 
anybody helping with this stuff. And, no, it's sacrifice. It's sacrifice. Uh, you know, like Dolan said, uh, if he he said that if he didn't have a family and all these things, he could probably try to get to your ankles. <laughs> You know, because everybody knows that you you produce a lot of books very fast, and and that comes with a cost. You're not the guy to travel, cruise around the world like actually Hoagland does, and <laughs> <laughs> you're you're chained to your typewriter all the time. It seems. Yeah, I I literally am. I, I jest with people on my vid chats that you know this is my social life, and that's quite yeah. true. It is. Um, I I've always been a homebody, but doing this stuff. It's it's constant, and you know I'm always reading something, and reading takes time. Mm. And particularly if if you've ever seen my library, I annotate my books very heavily. I have a system of doing it that uh, once you know the system, uh, that's what allows me to produce a book so quickly. Once once I get the reading done, because it's simply a matter of of pulling the book off the shelf and turning you know, looking at my notes, turning to the right page. But um, I can write a book very quickly once I start the physical process, but it's the behind the scenes stuff. It's the preparation that's consuming. It's the uh, preparation that takes so much time. Yeah, no. But no, I don't have any secret teams. I don't have, <laughs> I don't have a secretary. I don't have anything remotely approach. I wish I did. Well, you have the Giza community. They have a role in this. Well, yeah, they, the community is interesting because they write my blogs, right? quite literally, because they're the ones sending me the articles, um, which to me is interesting because I get to see what people are looking at. Mm. And my big chore during the week is going through all the articles they've sent me and trying to recognize any trends and then blogging about those trends or the ones that are I think are the most important that week. So that takes time. So. Yeah, I think it's a good thing that uh, Hoagland and you uh, leave space for details to be elaborated on and explored by others in your coming behind you, you know. Um, so so in many ways, in many ways, that's what you've done too, because what Hoagland, the first steps he took, you really taken some of those steps and, Yes. Uh, yeah. He, he zoomed in on them. So that's how it has to be. Yeah, he was very influential. Um, when I first met him, I told him that, you know, I had been following him since his appearance on Larry King. And he said, oh, boy, that goes way back. And I said, oh. <laughs> how did you guys get into How did he discover you in the first place? Did um, you send your books to him or something? I don't honestly know. I wrote him a letter in 1988. Uh talking about two ortho-rotated tetrahedra and the phase space being a hexagon. And I think he forgot about that, but he mm. also got onto that idea of hexa hexagons on the axis of rotation with Saturn and the clouds and all that. So I was in contact with him, but he never responded to that letter. And then um, I don't know. Suddenly he started to talk about you and your books. I, you know, to be honest, I don't know how that happened. I'll ask him next time we have him on. Um, but he did invite me down in um, to his home. I think it was 2008 or something, and that's where that's where when we first actually physically met. Oh, okay. I think we had had a couple of email exchanges prior to that and a couple of telephone conversations prior to that. But I honestly don't know how that happened. I, I don't, rec I don't recall. Uh, it's been such a whirlwind because, you know, mm. first Hoagland and then Catherine Fitz and, and mm. all of that. Uh, I, I honestly don't know how any of that transpired. I I'm continually kind of, stupefied when I think of all the people that I've gotten to know in the last five years that I never would have dreamed mm. in my wildest imaginations would be reading my books, mm. you know, because to me, the, to me, they are high octane speculation by a hack from South Dakota. <laughs> <laughs> even so, Tom DeLong, I guess we could disclose. Yeah, even Tom DeLong, you know, <laughs> Jeez, Who knows? Maybe Podesta too. Maybe Podesta. <laughs> They're keeping an eye on you. 
<laughs> well, oh boy, don't get me started on that. Uh, yeah, I know no, they no. are. I know they are. Yeah. I told DeLong, check with your people whether they want you associating with me. Hmm. Oh, sure. um, but we'll not go there now. But uh, I'll just insert this uh, that I recommend everyone to do and go check those blogs and the community because it's so vibrant and uh, the few visits I've afforded to pay. By the way, Giza people, if you're listening, uh, I'm not alone in, in Forum Borealis and one of my team members is the guy who... Blue Green, my man Blue Green, he's he's the one actually being active on the forum Borealis, by the mm -hmm. way, on your site. It, it's right. more than me. Yeah. I, I'm there occasionally, but mostly lurking. I see. So he he tipped me off and he tells me that he gets uh, people contact him and think it's me. And so <laughs> what he's saying in Giza Desta, please don't describe that to me, <laughs> whatever he's saying there. But, but uh, when I'm there, um, it's so exciting. I, I don't get out until it's over. And especially these, you have these uh, regular talks only for members where you uh, you have the pre-chats, which are kind of informal and, and fun and right. where people have their inputs. Then you have the main lecture. It's just like a university. Right. And then you have the uh, after winding down where people often, have, because I'm always so late there. Well, and, it's and they're still talking. Yeah, it's, it's, you know, a lot of websites do vid chats, but you may get half an hour, an hour. Ours go on for, can easily go on for six or seven hours. Mm. Uh, I always show up about two hours early and we just kind of sit around and talk about whatever it is we're talking about. And then... Um, yeah, yeah, and I know much good stuff is actually being talked early. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, uh, it's, it's just... Mm. The formal chat is when people send me questions or comments in emails which takes up most of it and you're right it's a very diverse group of people uh they're all sharp as tack so and, brilliant educated yeah, they, in, yeah. informed intelligent it's amazing you've attracted the best well they're also willing to kind of speculate and it's an interesting demographic i think politically it spans the whole spectrum left to right i think Demographic. Yeah, but speculate. You say, but uh, half of the uh, alternative field is is wild uh, speculations. But the thing is, the, this is grounded speculation. Uh, yeah, well, this is argued stuff. The, yeah. these are these are very serious people. They they read on their own. They're interested in different subjects. You know, they bring their uh, personal preferences and, and likes and dislikes about subjects and, and experiences. It's a very and there's very... room for divergent views too. I'm oh, noticed. oh, mm. enormous! Um, I'm kind of always shocked. You know, we've got old people, we've got young people, mm. uh, we've got people all over the world in these vid chats. Uh, one guy in St. Petersburg, another in Tartu, uh, Budapest. Mm. Uh, we've got a couple in Germany. We've got somebody in France, Belgium. Don't you have people from China even? Oh, we've got, yeah, China, Macau and, and Shanghai, uh, Australia, Indonesia. You know, it's all over. So it's an international, uh, Kenya, Nairobi. Kenya. A big advantage to, to what comes out of that brew because there's so many ingredients yeah. that you have to, uh, you know, the elixir will come out of it, you know? Yeah, it's it's a it's a really diverse group of people you know what from now on i'll refer to it as the philosopher's stone <laughs> well it's yeah we we discuss a lot of philosophy we did kant uh last time somebody was asking about kant and uh i'm waiting for hi hey our, our philosophy show with you i thought that would be <laughs> because what we do here is that we have some populists uh shows just to get up the ratings right. and then we have the shows i'm really passionate about not that i'm not not that i'm faking anything i mean i, I like all of this I stuff understand. but i also have the, those things that i couldn't afford have one if it was just those things and i sincerely thought our talk about the we call it the hidden pattern of creation but it's uh, what we talked about then and but that's that's sailing up there as one of the more popular shows. Oh, good. And I think it's largely because you have an appeal far beyond the mere alien or antediluvian or materialist. You have a very philosophical-minded audience, too. 
yeah the the this audience is surprisingly philosophical um mm. i'm always i'm always amazed by what your show does um what the website members do uh it's 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 a very very it's both broad but it's grounded you know yeah. it's it's not it's not shallow and uh I'm always, you know, I always enter the vid chats with a little bit of trepidation because the people's questions are more often than not above my ability to answer. But <laughs> no, but as a good scholar, you admit if you don't have an answer and you're not afraid to speculate either. So, I, call, I mean, we, we're all suspicious. Thinking people are suspicious to the people who pretend that they have the answer to everything and you can't even question it. Yeah, that's true. That's typical for some people in the field, but I'll not mention any names. <clears throat> <laughs> well, not sad you, but at true. least. Yeah. Uh, sad but true. That is true of this field. But there are some there are some solid, genuine researchers out there. Ufology Ufology would be a complete shambles if it wasn't for Richard Dolan, for example. Oh, so right. I mean, stop and think about it. Ufology would be an absolute diva. <laughs> <laughs> well, it would It'd be like an opera, you know, the same characters singing the same roles at every damned conference. Yeah. Um, it, you know, it'd be an absolute clusterfuck if it wasn't for him. Um, and I'm not mentioning any names either, but I could mention <laughs> you can think of a few old names that have been around forever yeah. and a day. And some new that doesn't contribute either. Oh, well, and some new, yeah. yes. I'm not, I'm not into blue chickens other than mm. for, you know, food. But <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I don't know if that's even qualified to be called ufology. Uh, Maybe mythology, something like modern mythology. It's nuts. It, well, I think I think Dark Journalist has that one nailed. It's it's a yeah. marketing plan yep. that somebody in the intelligence community came up with. I think he's absolutely nailed that right on the head. <laughs> and if they didn't come up with it, they so certainly took advantage of it. Yeah, absolutely. The the let it happen hypothesis. <laughs> yeah. Well, I no, I think I think it was a plan because those okay. two secret space program conferences really uh, really set them on their ear because, but, but yeah, I, th I think those two space program conferences, um, set them, set them back because they were serious. There right. were, there were a different group of people than the usual divas and they were all talking about some serious things. And then we get the marketing scheme. <laughs> so I, yeah, think, now the SSP has become a joke to many. Yeah, exactly. And I, I think that was intentional. I mm. think that was I think that was their response. They wanted to kill they wanted to kill a change in the conference culture in this country. And you know, the conference culture in this country is just really bad. Yeah. <laughs> it's just you know, yeah, I, but this force is trying to fix that. I want to say that uh, a thing you, Dolan, Hoagland, Fitz, many others have in common mm -hmm. uh, is that you are interdisciplinary, that you entertain broad aspects mm -hmm. and approaches. That, that's kind of a break with the old school divas. Well, yeah, we're interdisciplinary and that's always the hazard because when you're generalizing – you always open yourself up to the, the fallacy of the footnote. Um, mm -hmm. The old adage about Hegel being challenged by a student, you know, Herr Professor, your theory doesn't square with this fact. And his response was, was well, then so much the worse for the facts. <laughs> <laughs> I haven't heard that one. That's great. But, well, yeah, you know, it's typical <laughs> Hegel. Yeah. <laughs> but, yeah. But um, that's the problem with being a generalist, because there's always going to be the specialist who yep. can argue the nitty gritty and throw sand into the transmission. But um, that's been the problem with academics. That's because they have the head buried in the sand. That's what that well, is. yeah, that, you know, anybody can do that. Mm. But that's the problem. We're We're not able to academics has become so specialized in the last century that it used to be academics was precisely to teach you how to be able to think across disciplines. But now it's... In many ways, I'd say that the Cosmic War is an interdisciplinary book. It is. Yeah, absolutely, it is. Unlike, unlike some books of yours that are specializing, this one is, yeah. is a grand take on it.
Yeah, some of my books are specialized, but they're specialized in a general sort of way. But yeah, Cosmic War is a is a broad brush, a very very broad book. Um, it's and it was meant to be that way, because like I say, I regard it as kind of the keystone in the arch of all the other books, mm. because it's connected in some way or fashion to all the other books. Very well. So now to take that on. I'm ready. And I guess our starting point, Joseph, is... I mean, we can't avoid it, and that's Sitchin. I think we should start right. there, because when he came onto the... I'll give him the kudos that when he came onto the field, it was fresh. Right. But he launched a um, Frankenstein monster that went completely out of control, and he <laughs> didn't even agree with many of these wild interpretations and, and, and doomsday panic. I mean, people were afraid of mm -hmm. the Nephilims coming back and, and taking over and exp uh, Planet X and all that. Just yeah. Yep. As I see it, you, you're more sympathetic to Sitchin than to Sitchinites. <laughs> <laughs> oh yeah, yeah. But still, there's yeah. a criticism here, and you are diverging. So, could we have that as a starting point? Sure. Well, the way the way I came to this cosmic war thing was actually via the Giza Death Star hypothesis, because Sitchin wrote a book called "The Wars of Gods and Men," in which, in passing, he kind of half haphazardly mentions that the the pyramid functioned as a weapon and then he he just sort of leaves it there he tosses that out and he doesn't really pursue the idea uh, he's much more interested in the fact that wars were fought over these things and by means of them which is what i thought was also very interesting mm. but he doesn't really elaborate that either idea so what i did in the uh, Giza Death Star books was I just wanted to look at the idea of a weapons hypothesis. Did it make any sense? Could you make a case for it? Mm. And then in the Cosmic War, I wanted to look at the idea, well, is it really true that these texts talk about using pyramids as weapons and fighting wars over their possession? And in both cases, I think you can make the case. And this is kind of uh, where I where I departed or, or took off from Sitchin, the texts that I examine <coughs> in the Cosmic War are, to a certain extent, they're the same texts that Sitchin does, but I, I add some others that I think are relevant to the case. I add some Hurrian texts. Uh, I, I look at some of the uh, Egyptian texts. Yeah, but let's just say that the Sumerian lore is his starting point for those who are not right, yeah, too aware. Yeah. It's Sumer. Right, exactly. Now, one of the things that is interesting about his idea that that really is kind of the centerpiece of my book is this idea that the wars of the gods were fought over the possession of weapons of mass destruction. So mm. in other words, the wars were fought not only to control these things, but also to, and by means of those things, but in, in the case of the text that you see me examining, they were fought in order to eliminate these things. So it's a very, very interesting thing. It's a very modern sounding thing if you get right down to it. Uh, it's almost, and of course for Sitchin, the, the, the uh, thing that I found so frustrating about his work is that he's talking in terms of rockets and nuclear weapons. And I'm looking at it from the standpoint that whatever these th things were that they were fighting with and fighting for, they were certainly much more powerful and much more destructive than than nuclear bombs, uh, which is which is kind of my point of departure from him. Now, one of the texts I examined in the Cosmic War that I, I was just dumbfounded, dumbstruck when I read it, is the so-called Epic of Ninurta. This is a Sumerian text, and that's the title. And I included the whole thing in the Cosmic War because I wanted people to experience the same thing that I experienced when I read it. Because, you know, when you think of, 
of the word epic, you're thinking Homer, you know, <laughs> or something like that. Mm. You're thinking of something that would be, in other words, more or less entertaining to read. <laughs> but, but you sit down and read the epic of Ninurta, and it's anything but an epic. It reads more like the index to the Sears catalog. <laughs> it's right. it's as about a boring of a read. That well, she, if you're a bureaucrat, you probably well, if yeah, if turned on. <laughs> Yeah, if you're working for the Infernal Revenue Service or something like that, <laughs> you probably find this a pretty exciting read. But for the rest of humanity, no, it's, <laughs> it's, it's got to be one of the dullest texts that you'd ever read. But I wanted to include the whole text precisely to get people to see that this isn't an epic. It's an inventory. Mm. And what it is an inventory of are the inventory of the weapons that were taken at the end of this cosmic war. And I've always drawn the, the uh, analogy to World War I uh, because you have almost the same thing being played out in this so-called epic. The first thing they do is inventory all of these so-called stones, these, these tablets of destinies. And they slate some of them for destruction they cart off others for use in other applications. And then there's a very small category of these, these tablets of destinies that are so destructive and that cannot be destroyed, which is very interesting. They are hidden away. But hang on. The tablets of destiny, that's a clue. Is this inventory the same as the tablets of destiny yes yeah that's what these that's what's called the uh, tablets of destiny right yeah that's that's what this inventory is it's an inventory of all of these different may gal gal that's what the sumerian term is which is usually translated tablets of destinies mm. so the this is an inventory and when i read it i thought geez this sounds like the french and the british at the end of world war one right. taking an inventory of everything in the german war machine carting off some of it uh and then turning around and destroying some some others of it and of course the germans doing what the germans do hiding some you know, some of it mm. for use at a later date <laughs> <laughs> no, but let, let's go, go into this a little. You, you're not to taking away the interpretation, the consequences of that, but let's let's make people a little more familiar with the protagonists and antagonists. Um, you have uh, names like Tiamat and Marduk. Often, right. many people interpret them as planets. Then you have the very well-known gods like Enlil, Ninurta, right. and Enki. Right. Mm -hmm. And I think we should should outline a little what the drama is about. Well, the drama, quite frankly, is if you look at at these texts and look at the text, not just the Sumerian text, but some of the others that are very suggestive, like the Hurrian text, the Edfu text. Mm. What's always the case, it seems to me, is that these wars are being fought over who gets to possess these horrifically destructive technologies. It's almost as if you're looking at an ancient version of, of the issue of proliferation, okay? Right. And what they're fighting for is possession of these things, and at the same time, they're using these things to fight their war. And if you look at it from the standpoint of, of the Sumerian pantheon, for example, if you, if you look at Lawrence Gardner's um, family tree, so to speak, of, of the Sumerian pantheon, what you discover is that one side of, of the family tree is fighting the other side of the family tree. So, so who are the factions? Yeah, this precisely is it. You're dealing with factions representing Ninurta, Nergal, Enki on one hand, your mm. Enlil, Anu, and people like that on the other hand. And again, I can't help but think, you know, and I've I've used this analogy over and over in, in my interviews and in conference presentations. In fact, in, at the Secret Space Program conference in Bastrop, Texas in 2015, my whole first presentation was drawing out the implications of the ancient texts and World War One, because what was World War One? 
Well, it was a big family feud. That's <laughs> yeah. was what it was. You know, you, the Kaiser's Queen Victoria's grandson and cousin to Tsar Nicholas II and related to the House of Habsburgs in Austria and the Savoys in Italy and on and on we could go. And by the extension, the World War II was, you know, a part of World War One. It yeah, just you know, a revival World, of it. Yeah, World War Two was Act Two, you know. <laughs> yeah, so, Act Two, and and I would say even the Cold War was Act Three. Yeah, yeah, it's it's been it's been a long sort of family struggle, but but the interesting thing is you have this inventory being taken at the end of World War One of of German technology of the German war machine and. Certain things are prohibited to the Germans, you know, don't use these things again. <laughs> you know, we've had right. enough of that. Yeah. And it's almost like you're reading the Epic of Ninurta updated a bit because this is exactly what you see there. An inventory is being taken. Some things are being carted off and reused. Some things are being destroyed. And then there's that mysterious class of things yeah. that can't be, be destroyed. destroyed. And they're hidden away. <laughs> exactly. It sounds eerily like uh, Lord of the Rings. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Exactly. It's exactly the same. In fact, you even have a chapter called uh, Lord of the Rings of Satan. <laughs> yes, exactly. Exactly. Uh, there is a chapter called Lord of the Rings in the book, and it's all about this, the moon of Saturn called Iapetus. Um but, but and we have the mysterious sound eye. Is sound-based technology a factor here? Yes. Again, I go back to what I said in the first part. If you if you're going to destroy a planet, then the easiest way to do it would be to manipulate the fabric of space time. In other words, you're going to you're going to create uh, waves, longitudinal waves in the fabric of space-time itself. And, and, and a longitudinal wave is an acoustic wave. It's a, it's a wave of compression and rarefaction. So in other words, acoustics, if you extend the principle to, uh, to encompass the idea of an, uh, an area of rarefaction and compression, Mm. in the fabric of space-time itself. Yeah, you could you could describe that as an acoustic wave. So yeah, sound eyes, all of this stuff. Um, but, but let's pause. Yes, yeah, sorry, let's pause here a little because um, there's a couple of interesting um, indicium, substantiations here. You have, uh, obviously you have the notion that uh, sound is so essential to to our, our existence that many, both Indian and also the biblical and many, the, in the beginning was the word, that's like a creational word that God right. uses. There's an indication. You have also many people who think that the uh, pyramids were somehow made by or also that they were working through sound that's always yes, been that's quite correct right mm -hmm. and then you have a very interesting discovery recently um i it's i don't think it's shock's discovery but he's the one who made me aware of it and that's that in um, gobekli tepe they thought that two of those huge columns were very firmly grounded below because it was all originally buried but when right. they uncovered it they noticed that it was so lightly attached that they were working like a tuning fork yes yes so we see that the further back you go the more the sound specter of uh, technology is a part of this oh yes absolutely Absolutely. You have to remember something. I pointed this out in Grid of the Gods. You have to remember that for the ancient cultures, the first physics unification, the first unification in physics was not magnetism and electricity. It was music. It was sound. Right. Pythagoreans. Pythagoreans. Absolutely. And in fact, I happen to think, and I, you know, I've kind of alluded to this in, in the various books, I happen to think the Pythagoreans knew all about the West, our modern Western system of, of tempering the harmonic series. Mm. Uh, I think they knew all about it. They certainly discovered the problem. It's no secret, you know, the Pythagorean comma. So they knew about the, the problem with the harmonic series, and I think they figured out that it only took a slight mathematical adjustment to be able to create an, a, an artificial harmonic series that unified the fundamental overtones. Mm. 
uh, and basically allowed you to change keys in the middle of a piece. I think that was their big secret, as a matter of fact. We wouldn't have music today if it wasn't for that. We, we, would, we would not have our modern Western music at all if it weren't for that, if it weren't for that tuning, if it weren't for that slight mathematical adjustment. It says, and I've said this over and over, it's as if nature presented us a puzzle to be solved. Mm. And, you know, that was the first step in solving it. Um, physicists have been looking for trying to figure out how do we do that with the entire harmonic series, not just the auditory, but the electromagnetic. Exactly, because this was a micro um, right. version of right. it. But it's the right, same exactly. principles if you zoom out. It's the same principle. Yeah. And if you look now at, at these ancient structures, particularly the Great Pyramid, what you discover is that these structures are meant and designed to vibrate. The Great Pyramid in particular, because it sits on four sockets that are kind of like ball and socket joints in, in a skeleton, mm. uh, which allows that structure actually to move and vibrate with the earth. So it's vibrating constantly. Mm. Um, and of course, we have Christopher um, Dunn. Done right. Who was one of the first to come out with uh, the fact that the pyramids, whatever else they are and have been used for, also there's a huge case there for them being machines. Oh yes, absolutely. And from there, there's a short step to your conclusion. Well, if you look at the Grand Gallery, for example, in the Great Pyramid, if you look at it not with an Egyptologist's eye, but if you look at it from the standpoint of an engineer, it's one big, long acoustical resonance chamber. Mm. It's almost like an organ pipe in some respects. So if you look at it from those points of view, yeah, this is, this is an acoustic device of some sort. We don't know exactly what. But yeah. This you, you know what Carmen Bolter just said? What's that? She said that, uh, the, you know, those two huge cavities they recently discovered? Yes. Mm -hmm. She's convinced that because, you know, it always ent entices the imagination and uh, speculative mind. People think they find, I don't know, so, you know, the mainstream notions, oh, some dead king buried with all his treasures. No, I'm in line with her thinking that if they at all they find something there, it has to be machinery. Yeah. Stuff that will confirm it as a machine. That's weird coming from her because she has a huge spiritual aspect to this. But there's, uh, again, there's not an either or here. Right. <laughs> right. The texts the text do indicate that these weapons, whatever they were, were, were fundamentally acoustic in nature and put quotation marks around acoustic because, again, we're talking about waves of compression and rarefaction in the fabric of space-time. We're talking about space warps, quite literally, yeah. in, in a certain sense, that that have been weaponized. One more substantiation. Uh, Michael Tellinger, mm -hmm. he uh, also points to sound as... I don't know what you make of his, his stuff, but at least he's on this track that these ancient South African uh, ruins are sound-based structures. Too. Yes, yes, yes. I think that's the case. Um in fact, uh, I think a lot of those structures are acoustical resonating cavities. Um, this is this is a principle you see in temples all the way up to Rome, to the Roman Empire. So I think there's, uh, you know, given the, given the ancient obsession with the music of the spheres and viewing the cosmos as as a harmony, quite literally. Yeah, and you did you know that in the Samothrakian mysteries, in order to be a master, you had to master the the. It wasn't enough that you were like a spiritual person; you had to be able to master the resonance. You had to be able to vibrate right. the holy words, right. much like in India in mantras. Right, right, exactly. So that's a remnant of of the importance of the sound aspect. Right, I think so. Absolutely. I think so. So we, we see then pyramids all over the earth, Joseph, mm -hmm. and uh, some are younger, of course, but especially those that are, I mean, they, with satellite technology, they found that there's so many buried pyramids still in, in Egypt. Yes. We have the notion of the Bosnian pyramid. We have uh, the rumor of the Antarctica pyramid. Uh, we have the alleged uh, submerged pyramids. Yep. And uh, whatever we make of this, at least we know that the Great Pyramid is 
antediluvian. And uh, so there's... It's, it's a very short step from that to thinking, OK, if they built one, they could have built many. And if they did, and if you have a pyramid on Mars, even Sidonia, then what are they for? Exactly. Exactly. Well, my thinking is that with the Great Pyramid, as you indicated, that you're again, you're dealing with an antediluvian structure. Uh, I, I'm I'm. Four square in agreement with Alan Alford's basic hypothesis that you're dealing with three different periods of construction at Giza, with the Great Pyramid being the oldest. Mm. Um, the other pyramids around the world, I do think, in some cases, exhibit machine like properties, but I think you're dealing by those points with possibly the exception of, of Teotihuacan in Mexico. I think you're dealing with a decline science mm. where they begin to be used more in, in the way that conventional Egyptology understands them as initiatory places, as parts of their religion, and so on. Um, and again, I, I would make an exception there for Teotihuacan. So I think you're dealing with many of those things. And, and a Bosnian, if the Bosnian is genuine, then uh, that too has to be an exception. That might be, and, and some of the under ocean pyramids might be. Mm. Uh, but clearly, I think... And certainly the submerged one, because of the date. Possibly. If you take away the water, we were at the very age where they built these uh, technologies, so they have to be. Well, what I... What I'm getting at here is is I don't think you can extend the machine hypothesis to all pyramids. Yeah. Okay. Uh, and I certainly don't think you can extend the weapon hypothesis to all pyramids. Uh, I There's a reason that, that I keep telling people that, that the, the weapon hypothesis I'm viewing solely as a property of the Great Pyramid and possibly – as a property of the design structure of Giza, but not necessarily of the other structures there. Right. So there is that bit of a distinction. But I'm certainly alive to the idea that at least some of these other pyramids, you know, the Pyramid of the Sun in in, um, in Teotihuacan in Mexico, mm. certainly exhibits a lot of machine-like properties. You know, there's been mica that's been discovered there, mercury, things of just very strange stuff. Um, the pyramid, even at Pumu Punku, that, that they've uh, discovered recently, also looks to me to be very machine-like in nature. So we have these weapons all around the globe and possibly off-world too. So they could have a role then in this war, right? Oh, yes, absolutely. Absolutely. I think so. But again, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to caution people, as I put it in the Cosmic War, the the cosmic war hypothesis is not dependent on the hypothesis of the Great Pyramid being a weapon or vice versa. No. Um, but it's I regard them as two different hypotheses, but they certainly are corroborative of each other. Oh yeah. And the fact that you find them not only on planet Earth but planet Mars mm. uh, is suggestive. But I don't think in each and every case you're dealing with a weapon. I think the Great Pyramid here is unique. Because it has so many dimensional analogs of local celestial space that it, it appears to me to be a, a harmonic oscillator. It's designed with all of those things in it simply so that it, it can be a resonating machine with local celestial space. And you don't find that in many of the other pyramids around the world. No, I have a stray thought I want you to chew on, uh -huh. because I know that in your investigations you entertain the weapons that couldn't be destroyed as objects. But now we know that pyramids have been buried. Right. And we know that people have tried destroying the pyramids right. time immemorial, and they haven't managed. So I'm thinking, what if... I mean, what if these are the weapons that can't be destroyed and was hidden? Well, I think, yeah, I think there's something to be said for that. Um, what would happen, you know, if, if, let's look at it this way, if you're dealing with the Great Pyramid with a coupled harmonic oscillator to the structure of local celestial space, and I think clearly you are, 
-hmm. What would happen if you destroy it? It might be catastrophic. Who knows? I don't know. Right. So, right. yeah, you, you might be dealing with the pyramids themselves being these things. And if, if Earth wasn't the main scene at the time, uh, we have a pyramid on Earth. Uh, let's bury that. So, so that would be, I mean, if the, if the exploded planet was the main scene, God knows what pyramids would have been there. But you see what happened to the exploded planet, right? Right. And... Uh, so I'm thinking that may be a place, a good place to hide stuff, you know, on Earth. If that wasn't the main scene, I mean, well, let's that look, was like a peasant outpost. Let's look at it. Let's look at it differently. Mm -hmm. um, let's go back to to the Epic of Ninurta, and and I talk about this in the Cosmic War in that particular category of things that could not be destroyed but that were hidden. Yeah. Now. If you look at Chris Dunn's hypothesis about the Giza power plant, and, and on this respect, I think he did the most excellent service to alternative research and speculation, because he points out that in the Grand Gallery, there are the slots, those 27 slots that line each side of the Grand Gallery, and that it has an acoustical resonance chamber property. So he speculates that there are things missing inside the Great Pyramid that made it function as a machine. Right. And one of the things that he speculates was that there were resonator banks, Helmholtz resonators, inside the Grand Gallery, whole banks of them. So in other words, he's he's literally thinking that this was a kind of musical machine, all right? Mm -hmm. Now, he did that entirely without any knowledge of what Zechariah Sitchin had said, based on his analysis of the Epic of Ninurta. Mm. Because in Sitchin's analysis, the Great Pyramid is the structure that they go into and pull stuff out of, so that that structure quits functioning as this horrendous weapon. And in his analysis, the Grand Gallery was full of these Tablets of Destinies, all right? Mm -hmm. So let's stop and connect dots here. If the Epic of Ninurta is an inventory of stuff that used to be in the Great Pyramid, and I think, again, Sitchin's on to something, and I think, again, based on his engineering expertise, that Dunn is on to something. So you have an engineer looking at it and saying there's stuff missing, and you have a textual scholar looking at it and saying there's stuff missing. Right. So where did it go? Mm. Where did that stuff go? And my guess is, is, if you're going to take the text seriously, then there's three possible places that you would want to hide stuff like that so that no one else would get it. It's like the keys to the cars is hidden. Yeah, it's like mm. the keys to the car. Right, exactly. One place would be Mars. Mm -hmm. One place would be the moon. Mm, right. And the third place would be somewhere in the Middle East. <laughs> right. And I've entertained this speculation publicly any number of times. I think that in addition to oil and all of the usual explanations for American and Russian and French and German involvement in that region – that the other secret agenda is they're trying to find this stuff. Mm. And to me, Al, the biggest example, the biggest clue here is the Baghdad Museum looting. Right. Because Saddam Hussein was digging up all of these places in Iraq. He had uh, French and German archaeological teams in Iraq helping him dig these places up. and So weird. He's not a cultural man at all. And he wanted to reinvent history as all megalomaniacs in his... He, he's right. like a god king. So what on earth did he... And, and tourism wasn't a big factor either. Right, so exactly. So what would be his motivation for, for I think, this? I think, he, I think he was looking for some of this stuff. I, he can read the Epic of Ninurta just like the rest of us can. So I think, yeah. And many people don't know that he actually entertained uh, notions similar to Sitchin and stuff. Oh, yeah, he did. So I think, yeah, I think I think some of this Middle Eastern ruckus is that they're trying to find some of this stuff. Because his regime wasn't a religious one, just for those who oh, are no. not to know this. No, no. It was a materialistic no. one. No. Secular. 
No, the the Baath the Baathist regimes over there are, are wholly secular states. The Assad regime in Syria is a Baathist regime. Mm. Uh, to a certain extent, you could even look at Muammar Gaddafi as kind of an extension of that whole secularizing principle. Yeah, but especially Iraq and Syria are relevant to the Sumerian. Uh, well, even stuff. even even Libya, because again, you find the reference to some of this stuff being hidden in Monte Libico in the mountains of oh, Libya. Wow. Ah, okay. ah, ah. So, hmm. in other words, every place that is a trouble spot. Mm. for Western policy is also a spot where you would find possibly some of this stuff. Yeah, and of course Egypt itself Go goes without saying. Of course, mm. Egypt, absolutely, absolutely. So, you know, I've always suspected, Al, that, that behind all of this stuff, there's a really deep hidden agenda that's going on with respect to the Middle East and, and all of the struggles there. They're looking for... Yeah, but you know what? That goes to the notion that uh, there's like a survival insight and rediscovery. And, and I, I don't think that's the place we should go today because uh, that's reserved for future talks because it's so relevant. Right. Uh, but it does, uh, just so people know, yes, uh, that grants are uh, kind of a contemporary knowledge. Someone is in the know of something. So, yeah, yeah. I agree. But let's go back to the ancients. Mm -hmm. So they had this war then and... Uh, one planet blew up. Uh, uh, by the way, what about the top capstone? Many people are <laughs> speculating that's the key, you know? Well, I think... Do you have any... I happen to think, yeah, I happen to think that the capstone was one of these objects okay. that was either hidden or destroyed. Because Herod the interesting thing here is that Herodotus records the capstone still being on the pyramid. That recently, wow. Yeah, when he saw it, and he also describes the, the Great Pyramid as having been covered, obviously, with limestone that was so bright during the daytime that you yeah. could see it from several, several miles away. Mm. And that when you got up close, it was not only covered with hieroglyphics, but also that there was a water line about halfway up. Mm. Now, take that for whatever it's worth. You know, Herodotus is Herodotus after all. No, 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 no. But that's substantiated by Shwala de Lubitsch, uh, Robert right. Schock, Anthony West. We know this right. now. Right, Due exactly. to the Sphinx. Right, So exactly. that's not weird at all. No, it isn't. But what that does mean is that the pyramid is older than yeah. the flood, which if you're a flood uh, person in in the alternative community, they usually date it between 10 to 12,000 years BC. So in other words, it's a very old, old, old structure. Yeah, but unlike the Sphinx, uh, the evidence is removed. The outer layer of the pyramids is, is right. you know, we destroyed it. So that's why they can't, and we can't date stone anyway. So it's up for, it's, it's in a mainstream perspective, the pyramid is still up for antediluvian possibility. Yeah, I think so. I think so. Mm. Yeah. So could that be the weapon that blew up uh, the origin to Ceres? I think it's entirely possible. But I also think it's entirely possible that it may be itself a structure that was built over a spot where the original uh, pyramidal weapon may have been. It's one or the other. Mm. But I do think, yes, I do think given all the strange properties of pyramids that, that scientists have been just tinkering and toying with, the Soviets especially, most people yeah. don't realize this, given all their strange properties, it's entirely possible that there were physics principles unknown to us that may have made at least some of these things horrifically powerful weapons. Because, again, you're really literally dealing with something that manipulates the fabric of space-time. Once you've admitted that, then weaponizing it, it's the sky's the limit. Yeah, but, but there's another perspective here, too, um, mm -hmm. based on what you've been saying. And that is that if they needed a place to live and the Earth wasn't an optimal uh, scenario, uh, and to the moon, mm -hmm. and to the pyramid as a harmonizer... Now, could the planet have been exploded from removing such a, a harmonic um, effect? Sure, sure. Instead of being, you know, instead of a, a ray pointed to it, and like Star Wars. Well, again, again, it's not, it's not, 
you're thinking in the wrong way about the pyramid being a weapon. It's not a point and aim weapon. It's a resonance weapon. Right, right. So in other words, think of it like the open string on an acoustic piano and you hit that same note an octave lower or higher. Uh, it's it's a resonance. Right. Yeah, but it's a Death Star wording that yeah. puts me off track here, you know. <laughs> yeah, it, it does. It does many people. But. Uh, it's not it's not a point and aim weapon. It's a resonance weapon. Right, so right. you don't actually have to aim it. But yeah, it, it could be that these things are somehow playing with a a planet's gravitational field, holding it together, and so on and so forth. It is interesting to me that many of these pyramidal structures on Earth appear to be built over nodal points in yeah. in the so-called world grid and grid of the gods. again we have to understand what i think is behind the world grid and most people don't get this but if you're if you're dealing with standing waves in the planet itself that are moving over the surface of the planet and you're creating several different waves you know you're thumping the planet at different points on the planetary surface it's going to create interference patterns right. at certain points on the surface and at those points please hear me now because this is hugely important for what i'm talking about in terms of resonance at those points all the vectors of those waves will zero sum so in other words it will not appear that there's a great deal of force there, but there is. It's a pure magnitude of force. It's not traveling in any particular direction. It's just there mm -hmm. as the result of all those vectors zero summing. So once you've admitted that, then if you locate something at those points that taps into that energy, you can create resonance effects presumably anywhere on the planet you know spooky action at a distance is what einstein mm. called it and if you if you extend that principle to to interfering longitudinal waves in the fabric of space time then you can create resonance effects off planet mm. so i think you're dealing in other words what i'm suggesting here is you're dealing with an extremely sophisticated and very advanced physics with some of these things and again you read the you read some of the ancient texts from that point of view and it's very clear that they're trying to describe something very sophisticated in the mm. best language that they had mm. just to go completely overboard with speculation if there was <laughs> <laughs> a similar structure on let's just call it ceres so we don't have to say the exploded planet all the time okay. let's say ceres the original ceres let's say they had a similar similar constructions that were keeping their planet in check for being good place for life right and you use a Sidonia or a giza against their stabilizator Right. Then you have a both. It's not an either or. You have both right, exactly. an external course and an internal kaput short yeah, circuit. It, it stands to reason that if you are if you are going to have a society, an interplanetary society, you're going to have to have communication mechanism and longitudinal waves would be perfect for it because you're literally not subject to the constraints of, of the speed of light. Right. So these things would be mechanisms for kind of holding the whole thing together. And therefore, yes, you could use them to tap into other resonators of similar nature on other planets and load energy into them and blow them up. So, yeah, hmm. this is this is an extraordinarily speculative, sophisticated type of um, thinking I'm advocating here. Um but I, I happen to think it is the case just based on what the texts themselves are relating. And again, you know, it's it's a way of looking at those texts. It could be that the academics are entirely right. I happen not to think so, but you have to... Well, no, no, no. That we know they're not. That's what gives us <laughs> license to speculate here. We don't have to be right, but even if we're wrong here, that doesn't make them right. Well, that's true. <laughs> we're not in that dichotomy dimension. So That's true. But... Uh, you know what? It's a very depressing uh, thought on a theological, philosophical basis because that means that that so sophisticated. I mean, we call these, we deify these entities, these people, 
And even back then, they were so human in a, in a bad way that, yeah. you know, errata est humano or something, that they, so much hate, so much destruction, mm-hmm. despite their level of, that doesn't bode well for us today. And we're in, you know, we're in a transition phase now where we are getting on to, to this level mm-hmm. and we haven't solved the human problem. That's the entire problem, right? We 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 are full of bad, uh, you know. We we are children with matches, basically, and they were. Well, so what I think is interesting. <laughs> it's it's what I think is very very interesting. It is profoundly disturbing. But what is very interesting mm-hmm. is when you read those ancient texts, particularly where humanity is mentioned. What you see is basically a a very corrupt power mad oligarchy a political class right that has nothing but contempt for the vast lot of of humanity right to the extent that they're willing to destroy it with floods or what have you and it's that class that exhibits you know the gods that are exhibiting this extremely psychopathic mm narcissistic behavior it's not humanity no as in earth people yeah right Um, exactly exactly it's again it's a parallel to what we see now you have a corrupt oligarchy that is so totally out of touch with with the people that they're they're obviously contemplating massive amounts of destruction and and trying to do destructive things and have done many destructive and things. Have, so. And have done many destructive things. We call it history. But yeah, we the, call it history. <laughs> the lesson to take from this, then, uh, there, there's actually a political lesson here, and that is that oh, yeah. if we're going to survive as a species, we have to restructure our our structure. We, we cannot let these alienated uh, oligarchs go on. Right. Uh, you know, 0.1% now. The way they used to be 1%, now they're 0. It will end up with a, a handful of mad people with total power. Well, again... And history will repeat itself. A, yeah, those texts are very interesting because as a result of this cosmic war, you know, if you're blowing up planets, it's going to affect everybody in the solar system at some point. Mm. And as a result of it, I've always maintained that that whatever civilization was here utterly collapsed. You know, the mad oligarchs were banking that they could pull it off and wouldn't be caught in, you know, wouldn't be caught in the fallout, so to speak. And, you know, surprise, surprise, they were. And yeah. they literally had to jumpstart humanity on, on the road back up to that level. Uh, but they had blown their entire infrastructure apart, depopulated everything. Um, that's the problem. Uh, you you play the war dice, and and things get out of control. And you know it's like Operation Barbarossa. Everything's going smoothly <laughs> un- until the nutcase decides that he's going to change up the whole plan midway through it. Mm. And you know, um, this this is what you see in these texts. So yeah. Um, we have nothing is new under the sun. Nothing is new under the sun. Ex- Ecclesiastes, absolutely, and mm. uh, it's it's frightening in a way, but at the same time, it's it, I, I kind of have to laugh at it in a certain sense because here we are again. We've got our weapons of mass destruction, and we haven't learned anything. Exactly. Um, it, 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 at some point, you have to think, well, maybe we'll get it sooner or later. <laughs> you know? But it's not going to happen as long as we keep listening to these oligarchs and, and giving them the serious attention that they think they deserve. Um, no, but this is yet another of many, many, many reasons they would want to cover up the truth about our distant past. Because many people can't understand why can't they just come clean about how old we are. Blah, blah, blah. They, 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 people who, you know, they can't connect the dots. They don't see how obvious it is that you have to right. cover this up. But here's another reason, because... If the elites are causing havoc all through history, you better be the one who writes history because you don't want people to wake up to that fact. Well, the problem is if the elites are writing history and they've been this destructive all along, then that gives them a certain spiritual heritage to certain nefarious individuals that we might as well 
mention who they are. Uh, you know, you've got the Satan tradition in, in the biblical literature, even in Islam. You've got uh, you've got uh, the bad guys in in the Ramayana and, and the uh, Mahabharata. And you do have it here too in in the Sumerian. Sure. And and I want to get to yeah, that absolutely. But finally, before we take the break, Joseph, we can't avoid the obvious. Mm -hmm. The question then is mm -hmm. ancient breakaways. <laughs> Did anyone survive? I've always had the model in my head, Al, that yes, there were survivors of this war because number one, the texts indicate this. Exactly. I mean, if you're taking inventories, you've got survivors. Mm. But I've also had as my model the the World War One analogy. In other words, World War One was basically a stalemate. You had the Entente powers laying siege to Central Europe for, for four years, and basically they get nowhere, you know, and everybody just decides we've had enough, we're quitting. Um, this is the way it looks to me in these ancient texts. You, you, you have a tremendously destructive war, blows apart the infrastructure, blows apart the economy, and people survive on both sides. Yeah, but I mean, did anyone survive with the toys intact? Obviously, we, we are here, so there were survivors. But did anyone like... Because if one planet exploded, another one in Mars got desolated, uh, Earth, obviously, there were... Life went on, but they would have to have outposts, bases here and there. Sure. Right? I think... I think it's entirely possible, although I don't discuss this in any of my books, but I do think it's entirely possible. It's Hoagland area, but yeah. Yeah, mm. yeah, that you have you have survivors somewhere else other than on this planet. Again, that the text would seem to indicate that. That puts a uh, spin it, on the ancient aliens uh, theories, you know? Yeah, yeah. It, I, I've said it many times. I think we've got cousins out there. In other words, I think the genus Homo, Mm. is is bigger than this planet homo sapiens sapiens is one one species within that big genus mm. um and there's every indication you know both from ufological studies and and even on earth even on earth neanderthals yeah exactly yeah Neander just as intelligent yeah neanderthals and so on uh, so yeah, I think there's I think there's every possibility that you might have some of our cousins out there that may have survived with some of this technology. Could they have Could they have put a cap on Earth to keep people here? Ah, I was just getting to. Mm -hmm. Let's take our break and come back and tackle that one. Um, okay, that sounds great. That's an excellent topic. That's a, that. And also, we promised people to go a little into the culprits uh, who who was behind. So I want you also in the last part to account a little for the personalities involved here. Okay, sure. especially and Key and and Lil because that's a very interesting mystery oh, yes. right there, right? <laughs> oh yes, <laughs> conflict of interest or whatever you want to call it. So. Good guys, bad guys. But that's a teaser then, people. All right. Don't go anywhere. We'll soon be back in part three. All of our files are free and will remain free. If you like the show, you can show support by donating $1 to help with expenses. Just use the PayPal link on our website, YouTube channel, or Facebook page. Thanks. Thanks. 